celebrations. Thank you for coming to show that Cab Franc love. We absolutely love it. And um, we're just going to have a nice conversation about Cab Franc. Please be muted so that we don't have that background noise. We will, I will try to see what these, you know, if questions come in, but we'll, uh, I'll do the best that I can. So ask the questions away in the chat and, um, Happy Cab Franc, almost Cab Franc Day. So welcome, everybody. All right. So my first question is, I'm just going to go around and if each of my winemakers can come in and just do a brief introduction to yourself, tell us who you are and what winery you are with, and we'll go around that way. So, uh, Peter, you're already up on my big screen, so... <laughs> If you can I don't start. know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Peter Celine, Celine Sellers out of Santa Rosa area, California. Hey, uh, Christy. Christy Tacey uh, from Tessier Winery uh, out of Healdsburg. And Michael. Uh, Michael Budd, Tristina Wines at uh, Paso Robles, California. Diana. Diana Jones, Jones Vondrell Vineyards and Winery out of Thurman, North Carolina. <laughs> uh, and Tanner, you can introduce yourself also, please. Yeah, my name is Tanner Pardue. I'm also at Jones Vondrell and Thurman. And Stephen. Stephen Mirasu from Lotra Coat by the Stephen Kent Winery in the Livermore Valley, California. Awesome. David. David Stannard, happy Cabernet Franc Day, everybody, from Paradise Rescued in Bordeaux, France. Woo! -hoo, we got Bordeaux in the house. We go. <laughs> and um, I don't know, is Marta here? No. Okay, so Marta is, is from Argentina, but um, she was having issues. So um, hopefully she can join us in a little bit. And let's see. Uh, John, I don't think you're here. So John is from Almasol Winery in Paso Robles. And Leah? Hi, Leah Jorgensen. I am the sole Oregon uh, participant. I'm based in Newburgh, Oregon, but I uh, work with fruit from the Rogue and Applegate Valley. Um, and Chris, <laughs> did I get you already? No, Chris is not here. Chris um, from... Uh, Sassoon Valley. How are you yep. talking? There you go. Jacob from uh, Jacob Stussy. Hey, awesome. Awesome. Sassoon Valley, Visor Family Vineyard, Sassoon Valley. There you go. Okay. All right. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry about that, Jacob. Um, I was going through <laughs> off of emails. So we have 10 amazing winemakers here who all have a passion for Cab Franc. So my first question has to be like, why Cab Franc? What is so special about Cab Franc? And I'm gonna throw the bullet to you first, Jacob, because you're big and then we're gonna have a conversation. Um, well, I love Cab Franc because it's not Cab Sauv. That's <laughs> Um, I think there's more expression in it. Um, I think as a winemaker, and the fun part of making it is that it allows us to push it a little bit in different ways than we're, we're trying to make Cab Sauv. And if you're trying to make Cab Franc in a Cab Sauv, make Cab Sauv. It's what I always say. So it's the first uh, thing that pushed me into whole cluster fermentations um, maybe eight, nine years ago. And I did it because the thought process was kind of that it might actually enhance pyrazines and the green characteristics. And what I found very quickly was that it actually like integrates them and textually builds them in by doing it. So I don't, I've done it ever since for the last eight years and we've been, in, we've increased it to around 50, 50% these days. Um, and that's why I love Cab Franc because the earthy, the earthy side of um, dirty earthy side I love it. I love it. Steven, you're popping in. So uh, sexy, alive, lithe. Uh, just it, there's nothing more alluring, no grape that's more alluring than this variety, I don't think. I've been making Cab for 25 years, Cab Franc for probably 15 now at this point. 
There's, it's very expressive at the site, more so than Cabernet Sauvignon. It's, it's a variety that has great versatility, great beauty to it. It's, just, it's, it's delicious, and, and it can be made in a number of different ways, and I think that maybe we'll get to this later on, but it, it can be a little polarizing, but that's where the fun is as a winemaker. You get to trod that kind of line where a little too early, it's really green, and a little too late, and it's lousy Cabernet Sauvignon. But just right, it's this magical thing. It's a beautiful, beautiful grape. Who wants to speak up? I, I'd love to chime in. Um, and hi, Stephen, because we, hi, we go back like 20 years. So we it's do. always so fun. I love when we get to reconnect. It's my Great favorite. Great again. <laughs> uh, likewise. Um, for me, it, it's undeniably the ageability. I mean, when we talk about some of the most coveted wines in the world, you look at 1947 Chauveau Blanc, 50% Cab Franc. It's a 1947 wine enjoyable today because it's got 50% Cab Franc in it. It's got extraordinary, an extraordinary balance of acid and tannin. And, um, and for me, living in the Pacific Northwest is such a no-brainer because we have a uh, you know, people think Southern Oregon is like, oh, it's so hot. And it's, it's really, it, we've got high elevation. My vineyards that I'm working with are 1600 to 2000 foot elevation. And the valley floor starts at 900 foot elevation. We're getting some really cool evenings and even in August. Um, so you get this amazing balance of acidity and full days of ripening. And there's just nothing like that. I, it blows my mind that no one else is so fo is focused on it up here. So um, I thought I would take it into my own hands. It's to me just, it is a versatile wine. And living in the land of Pinot Noir up here, I have to say it's so much easier to work with. I mean, mm -hmm. Pinot Noir, I, I worked at Shea Wine Cellars. I worked at some amazing Pinot Noir producing houses up here. And it's a it's a very temperamental grape. It's It needs coaxing. It's also what makes it an extraordinary varietal. However, working with Cabernet Franc for me is when I say easier, I don't worry about it. I don't worry about what's going on in the vineyard. And when the fruit comes in, it's always clean and perfect and beautiful. So um, there's a lot to be said for that. And then I get to receive the fruit and, and get creative. And to the point of doing a, my, a white Cabernet Franc, Rosé of Cabernet Franc, and ageable wines. I'm using time in my toolbox to make wines that will age 20, 30, 40 years. Awesome. And they're beautiful too, Leah. Thank you, Stephen. Likewise, <laughs> we just had a bottle of yours the other night. Thanks. <laughs> See, Cab Franc winemakers stick together, right? They mm -hmm. enjoy each other's Cab Francs. Okay. Uh, Michael, how about you? Why Cab yeah, Franc? I, Love? I'm echo, echo all of those comments. I think it's, um, it, it's, it's part of the sites, part of the soils. It's um, when you're, whether you're making a 100% Cab Franc or or blending with other varietals. It, it marries well with other varietals. It marries well with so mm -hmm. many other varietals. Um, everybody always talks about blending Cab Franc with something else. How about blending something else with Cab Franc just to kind of add that, <laughs> that complexity? <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah. What's, what's interesting, Michael, is that certainly in the in the Bordeaux context that uh, Leah mentioned it there, that yeah, something like Cheval Blanc is uh, is indeed it's a 50 50 mix even 1947 even in 2021 there's more cabernet franc in uh, cheval blanc than there was uh, merlot but the world at large thinks it's a merlot wine and um, my perspective on that is well why would you waste your time in diluting a fantastic cabernet franc with merlot <laughs> <laughs> doesn't make any sense when you've got one of the most perfect vineyards in the world to make cabernet franc and mm -hmm. still these guys just don't get it that a varietal would be an absolute world beater. But, you know, time will tell. I actually reckon that um, I always say that uh, in the French context that Cabernet Franc is actually like Pinot Noir on steroids. Um, mm -hmm. I agree with Leah's comments about the, the, the robustness and the resilience of growing Cabernet Franc. Fantastic uh, a varietal to grow. But at the same time, it... it it does a hell of a lot more than than, than Pinot in, in, in my uh, in my books. Uh, the the aromas, the noses, the length, the complexity that you can get, particularly with a little bit of a uh, little bit of oak, uh, one or two year oak in there, is just fantastic. It is a superb all round varietal, and I must add also, it's not a bad blend wine if you have to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Diana Tanner, how about you guys? Tanner, you want to? respond or you want me to? Uh, I'll just jump in. Yeah, I think Cab Franc, it's just, 
it's you know it's the type of wine that you have and it doesn't necessarily jump out as with its own distinctive characteristic like a cab sauve or the sauvignon blanc it's not pointy but to me it's just you know what's there is more subtle and it's the type of wine that you have and you just kind of contemplate <laughs> when you're having it you know i just enjoy cab franc for that that i have you know i've been trying cab francs leading up to this from uh several different regions and you know every time it's like different areas and the different terroirs so that that's to me cab franc it's you know there's beauty in the subtlety of what it expresses i like that beauty in the subtlety i like it Did I miss anybody? Everybody? everybody? I guess I, I didn't chime in yet. I totally oh, agree with all of those things. Um, I think it's complex and very interesting. Um, there's a lot of length to it, a lot of body, um, but I'm just always allured by anything with the complexity. And you get, you know, floral notes, which I love, and then the earthy notes, which I love too. So that's why it's one of my favorites. I, I have I, not chimed in here. Oh, go ahead. I have not chimed in here yet, but um, I, I have to say, I echo what everybody said. I love the intensity of Cab Franc, and I think it's more expressive of the terroir than a lot of other fruit. And I especially like the fact that um, a lot, of, most other winemakers are burying it in the other wine to, to make up for their shortcomings in the other wine. And I like taking the field blends that people use for their intensity and power and what they brought to the fruit and let that shine in and of itself. And that's what Cab Franc does to me. I will add one more thing. I think Cab Franc is such a beautiful food wine. I mean, it just goes well with so many different types of food. It, it just makes it a, a beautiful addition to a meal. And we did talk about that in, in like every live is how you know, it can't, you know, cat not to really put down cab solve, but, you know, it, it is that, you know, that, you know, slab and cab thing or cab and slab, whichever direction you, you're supposed to say that. And it's, it's much more, you need something specific to go with Cabernet Sauvignon. And with Cab Franc, it is so versatile that it's a pleasing wine to a large, a larger palate. So what, Stephen, I'm going to go to you because I absolutely love how you always call Cab Franc sexy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no anyone who might take offense. Yes. <laughs> um, so Cabernet Franc is sexy. So everybody else, I, I want you to kind of see if you can think of, of a, a word, what, what you would use to describe Cabernet Franc, if you had to describe Cabernet Franc in one word, um, you know, so, so why, why sexy? What about it is sexy? Are you asking me that? Yes. Why sexy? You know, there, there's a, there's a, there's a mysteriousness to the wine. I mean, there's, if you get slightly unripe version of the wine, there, it's all in your face. You know, the pyrazine, the green, the, 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 the green pepper aspect of it. It's very um, on point, very much in your face, very lacking in subtlety. But when done right, and I think Mecca and some of the other folks here that, you know, when it's done well, it, there's an integration between the aromatics and the flavors, the structure, the acidity of the wine. If you're using wood, we and we generally, for us, it's older punchins. We don't usually use barrique in, in our wine. Large, larger format barrels. We want we want the structural hit of it without the organoleptic flavor aroma hit of it. There's I, there's sexy is is mysterious. You know, there there's there's a sexiness to that. There's when I taste really good Cab Franc it reveals only a little bit of itself that first sip and opens up reveals more and more with every subsequent sip there's something you're leading up to something glorious and and that to me is a really sexy characteristic and that wine for me that variety shows it better than any other grape that i can think of offhand mm -hmm. That was almost like a porn show right there, Stephen. Yeah. <laughs> I would have put the right music on if I thought yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So anybody else, what, how, what's that one word that you would, that, that's a tough, 
act to follow. But is there yeah. <laughs> is there another word that you would use to describe Cab Cabernet Franc? I would, I would just say, go ahead, Peter. So I just spit out. I just spit out alluring. Indeed. I like it. I thought the same. Uh, to me, chameleon. It's a chameleon because depending on how you farm it, what you do with it, you can you can express it in different ways. Like I said, I make a white cab franc, a rosé. I make two reserves um, with different time in the barrel, and I make a, a classic. You know, I call it my signature cab franc, eight months in barrel and ready to go. So it's like you can you can dress it up in different ways and put it on the table, and someone will be you blindfold people, blind taste people on on those wines, and and it's. Uh, it's a chameleon. You can really, really play with it. Absolutely. We'll, we'll piggyback off the, the the sexy. It could be the little black dress or the sweatpants and a hoodie. On a, yeah. On a <laughs> <laughs> Both work really well. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> it absolutely, you know, the, the little black dress, yes, it's cute and all that, but the sweats are in a hoodie. You're nice and comfy with it. It's a great wine. Love you, Mom. That's okay. So um, I'm going to start off with the first. Uh, so I have Blue Victorian here. Go on. Right. Blue Victorian. So you want to talk us through before we get into like kind of the next kind of general question of Cab Franc. Let's talk about this Cab Franc. How do you process it? What do you look for? This is the time of we're as we go through, we're going to go. This is where we're going to get a little geeky. So uh, tell us, you know, all the geekiness behind making this wine. Well, the piggyback off what was just said about uh, the one word. I don't know if I could put it into a word, but Cab Franc to me is very strong in the sense that um, it's going to do what it wants to do once you make the decision as far as picking. Um, and I like that in the sense that I don't have to try to, con I don't ever have, don't try to control it ever. Um, we also, this, this wine, we pick, we pick it very younger. I think the alcohol in the bottle is 13.5. I think it's actually probably around 13. Um, it comes from a very high potassium vineyard. Uh, the one thing that we've found with Cab Franc is planting it these days is hard to find clean cuttings around here. Yeah. So we've had a very hard challenge with that in Sassoon <laughs> Valley. Um, so with this one, we'll process with it as we bring it in. It's typically later in the season, uh, just, just because of uh, disease. Uh, it's partial whole cluster, about 50% whole cluster. And this, with Cab Franc, what we do is we line the bins. Everything we do is fermented in tea bins. So um, we line the bins with whole clusters and we crush on top of them. This is all native. Uh, there is a small portion, the blend, final blend on it has small portions of sand, or no, um, for sure, Petit Syrah, like a very early pick Petit Syrah. And I think maybe even some Sangiovese, to be honest with you. And, and I like Cab Franc in the sense that where Sangiovese can show so much um broadness and so different many styles i think cab front kind of has that similarity with that varietal as well um and it's and you can push them in some of those same in some of the same elements i think the same way so what we do is we we line them that way we just let them go um let them go native we press when they go dry typically 14 uh 18 days punch down pulse air uh we age everything in like uh to piggyback off of steven and punch-ins because we want to protect the aromatics and we do this has 30 percent new american oak on it um which you it's hard to pull it but when you put them in punch-ins it really it's really it really allows the fruit without um to keep to keep front and foremost you know without overpowering it i want to say that might even have a u stave on it which sometimes blows me away because you think it would overpower especially with the delicacy of it because the thought process in this isn't really california this is more like loire is what we're shooting for here so we're shooting more for not really chanon because it's i don't feel it's possible um i'm not like that other region right outside there a little more fruit i'm not i'm not big on all the regions in france i know we have someone from france here that could probably answer that for me or help me with that <laughs> but um but um that's that's kind of the process um we use petite sarah small portions of petite sarah just because sassoon valley does that well but we use this in the sense that it's Petit Sra picked at like 22 bricks. 
that we use to that won't mask anything. We use it for tannin structure and as a more of a core, a core sole, I guess you could say. So this wine to me has a has a lot of dark fruit to it. Um, okay. And there is definitely no, uh, I'm not getting a lot of the pyrazine, uh, anything like that, but it ha also has a bit of uh, licorice to me and a bit of that graphite that is you know, nice in a, in a cab franc. Yeah. I like the, um, I like the, the red fruit characteristic, like the strawberry, kind of that raspberry compote type aromatic, you know, um, not sweet, maybe like a raspberry just sure. before before it's too sweet a mountain raspberry kind of. And I think that's kind of the part of Cap Franc is it is earthy. So it kind of like everyone has talked about is terroir. Um, Valley floor, Sassoon Valley, heavy clay loam. It's not always easy to find terroir or find distinct characteristics in, in those things. But this, um, this Muvedra both do it very well. Okay, absolutely. So once again, for those who are following, this is Blue Victorian, and you are actually part uh, it, from the Sassoon Valley, but it's part of Viser family, right? This is like a, a different right. label for Viser family. Right. Okay. What's the production, Jacob, and what's the price? The price, I don't know, because I get the luxury of just making it. I like that part of it. Um, Production on this, we normally pick about two and a half to three tons. This year, I think I brought in like three and a half tons. Um, but like everyone did say, I've used Cab Franc in everything too. You know, so we we make a San Giovese, and the bet and I I call it a Sassoon, I call it Sassoon Tuscan, and so we use it in the sense of San Giovese being the base, Cab Franc, and then we use a very low picked Petit Strad to fall in like fifteen percent Cab Franc, and then ten percent. Of a petite straw to take place the cab saw because I feel like those early pick petites give more character and, and lend more to the character with trying to steal from it, you know. Very cool. I, I look forward to trying it. Cool. I'd love to. I, I know your name very well, Stephen. I've known you for a long time. I've known the name. So. <laughs> Appreciate you. <laughs> uh, all right. So, with going back to the general populace of our winemakers here, what made you? choose Cab Franc as your flagship wine or one that you are so passionate about? What made you choose that? Is that open to anyone? Anyone, yes. Or did he choose us? Oh, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> we, we. The world's a bit we. different in, in France, depending on where you, you, you're growing your grapes and making your fruit. Um, you know, certainly in Bordeaux, there's only a certain number of grapes you, you can have and, and put the Bordeaux label on it. Otherwise, you just you're, you're declassified straight away to, to Van de France or, or something uh, less pleasant. So for us, it was quite simply, it started out as a project and um, the Cabernet Franc bit was there. We, we bought the land in order to prevent um, uh, houses being built all over it and a 12th century church being obscured. And uh, the net result was that uh, just four days before signing the contract, we found out it was Cabernet Franc and not Merlot. So uh, it, it, it was a self-fulfilling passion that, that developed overnight. And to, to find that we were producing it just as a complete varietal in Bordeaux and being one of ooh, probably less than 10 producers out of 6,000 or so making a pure Cabernet Franc, uh, it was, it was a flagship overnight. It was the only wine we were making, so there wasn't a choice to get on it and enjoy the journey. It's been great. Um, for us, it um, you know we we love Cab Franc, but it's also a grape that has shown to do really well in our part of the country, in North Carolina, Virginia, even up into New York. Um, it sits in a premier site on our vineyard. The soil has a lot of schist and granite in it. <laughs> Um, and so Cab Franc isn't as unknown in our area as, as maybe other areas. Um, people aren't asking, well, what is that? Go, 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 go. Um, so, you know, it's, um, it's our largest red planting and it's, um, our largest, um, wine that we hold, our red wine that we wholesale to restaurants. And, uh, yeah, it's just, it's, um, it, it's been a great grape and wine for us. So. Excellent. Anybody else? I will chime in. It, it, as with a lot of things, for me, it comes back to a, a single cab franc that I ha had probably nine years ago that was 
phenomenal. And that ironically, it's not old world. Um, it was from a tiny Island off of Auckland, New Zealand. The winery was Tomodu. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of it, but Tomodu did a wine they called Tipua. And Tipua is a mythical shapeshifter. So every year the winemaker would decide, he'd walk through the entire, the entire lot of wine and decide, does a single barrel, a single varietal stand out from everything else within the winery? And if it did that year, that was the Tipua. If nothing stood out, then that year there was no Tipua. So 2011, there was no Tipua. 2012, the Tipua happened to be Cab Franc. And that's when I discovered Tomodu and I bought three bottles of it, brought it back with me because that's all you could bring back. Um, and it was, I think it was 90 New Zealand dollars at the time for the bottle each. And then the next time I bought it, it was 110 each. And then a friend said, I found the last case of it. And I said, buy me six bottles. She bought the other six. Uh, it was 160 a bottle, so about 120 US. Now they're about $500 a bottle. So can't find them anymore, but that was my favorite Cab Franc of all time. And when I started making, my friend who he he knew I love making wine. He's been making wine 20 years. He asked me what I wanted to do, and I said I wanted to make a Cab Franc. And that night he opened a Shiner, and it was his. Uh, what was it? It was a 2000 Cab Franc he made in his garage, and it was stellar. It was I would say right up there with that Tomodu Tipua. So. It just validated what I wanted to do. So I, I've been making wine much less than anybody else on here. My first vintage is tw the 20 that you're drinking. Um, and that's my first Cab Franc I've made. Um, but I, I love it. And that, that's a Fountain Grove. My last year is a, a, a Chalk Hill. And this year I've got a relationship with some friends and I'm getting it out of Alexander Valley. So to the point of multiple people, winemakers on here, Terroir is everything. So all three of those Cab Franc are within 20 minutes of each other, vineyard-wise, but they're astronomically different from one another, and I love that. Um, I, I'd love to chime in, Lori, if it's if it's cool. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, um, for me, it was always Clos Rougeard. That was like a no-brainer wine for me. I, I sold the Dresner book in Washington, D.C. before moving to my dad's home state of Oregon. And those are that and um, Clos Roche Blanche. Those are some amazing Loire wines that I just loved. Um, that's a Touraine blend of Gamay Cab Franc. Uh, those are wines that just sort of were my go-to wines when I would go to dinner parties, um, whatever, because it I knew those wines would whatever was being served, we'd be fine. Um, and honestly, in Oregon, my father was raised outside of Eugene, and I um, I just found. Um, some really incredible land um, vineyards in the Rogue Valley where a subduction happened 250 million years ago. So we've got clay loam, we've got fossils of ancient marine shellfish, um, shell imprints. I mean, you take a photo of it and it looks like pieces of the Loire Valley. Well, Emmett Valley is not Burgundy, but we can make these connections. We also have the river stones from the Rogue River um, that gives that same grit, you know, that the graveliness that you might you know talk about in Bordeaux. So when you talk about land and, and terroir, um, Rogue Valley and Applegate Valley have not even come into their own yet. I mean, everything's been 100% Willamette Valley and Oregon Pinot Noir. And the moment, the Rogue Valley is going to have its moment. And I am definitely pushing that narrative. Um, to me, it's a no brainer why it's not that I'm trying to replicate the Loire Valley because I can't, we're Oregon. However, I can make these connections and at least there's validation for why we plant Cabernet Franc, Merlot, Sauvignon Blanc in these vineyards, Chenin Blanc. I, yeah, just to, my, my two cents on this, you know, winemaking for me is, is an aesthetic exercise as much as it is a, an exercise of punching down and picking, you know, picking at the right time and all that, that all of this, the more sort of um, practical and craftsmanship aspects of, of winemaking. And there's, there is a, you know, there, there, there is again, sort of this connection between what Cab Franc can give you and how it ages and and how it changes over time that is as much an, um an emotional thing as it is an intellectual thing or a viticultural enological thing and 
tasting tasting Charles Jiguet's wines and tasting the Breton wines um, in the Kermit Lynch book back in the early 2000s, these wines spoke to me in that in that way. Again, that kind of mysterious, sexy aspect of the variety hit an emotional chord with me. And for, mm-hmm. for all of our wines, from Lotricote Cab Franc to Lineage, our Bordeaux blend and whatever else, we're trying to create emotional connections with the people who drink these wines because you know, great wine is always great. You know, there's always a time and a place to drink wine, period. Great wine, more so. But if you can create a connection with somebody that people start questioning, why did this guy, that gal, whoever, make that decision with that wine? You start this dialogue, and sometimes you never actually get a chance to talk to each other about it, but you create a dialogue every time you taste something that that makes you ask, well, "What the hell is going on here? What what why? why? What am I tasting? Why do I get this effect with this wine that I don't get with others?" And that's something that really you know fuels us through the long days of harvest and punch downs and stuff like that. And and I mean that for me that's that's the kind of I I want to conduct commerce of wine. And unfortunately, Jacob, I have to sell stuff too. So, <laughs> but I want to do That's it. In why your name's on it? <laughs> that, was a, that was a dumb decision on my part. <laughs> um, but, but there's, a, you know, being able to traffic in emotion with wine is something that is very appealing to me. And this variety um, is the most emotionally transparent in a way, or the most, um, you know, the most emotionally weighty grape that we work with so from that perspective Catherine checks all of these amazing boxes off wonderful yeah, I, I, think, I think Stephen. I, I mean i'll just jump in there for two seconds between peter's peter's comments and Stephen's comments are exactly echo how um kind of fell in love and found cab franc of essentially going through a tasting room um as a as a as a as a young professional and trying different types of wines and all of a sudden finding a wine that you don't know what it is and having the the tasting room uh, attendant turn the turn the bottle around and show you what it was going on cab franc what is that um, never heard of that before um, it was back in 1990 so you, you could put a year on that of when you're drinking it probably in 1992 and going like wow and all of a sudden you just when you car- continue, you can still taste it today, right? It's one of those wines you can still taste it, describe it today, and it's 30 plus years ago. Um, it's amazing. It's, it's amazing. Mm-hmm. So we're going to take, we're going to go to, before we go back to uh, winemakers and why, you know, how they fell in love with Cab Franc, I just want to bring up the second wine that we're going to taste, and that is uh, Sell and Cellars. So, uh, and he's already mentioned it's from the Fountain Grove district. So you want to give us a little bit geekiness on this wine? Absolutely. It's the only year I'm going to be able to get it. Um, it's not there anymore. Um, this is in the Red, Redland Hills. Um, it's Fountain Grove district, which I think it was an AVA six years ago now. So it's not an AVA very young, long ago um fortunately 2020 well unfortunately 2020 is a bad year for this area because of all the fires there's about a 50 percent plus loss in yield because of the fires um but this vineyard was above the smoke there was no, no smoke in that area at all which i loved um it was pulled at 26 brick we waited um uh as far as we i like pushing the fruit as far as i can go till i get the full flavor from the full fruit um rather than just the bricks level um and all of my fruit i i don't own vineyards i have lease contracts on most of my vineyards and this one was uh through a friend so um but so 26 bricks had to water it back a little bit to get it where i wanted it which i wanted about 15 percent or less and got 14.9 percent out of it um did do some extraction on on uh, um pulling it because i wanted to get it as dense as possible um i did go 100 percent new oak on everything and um fortunately we're able to get enough fruit out of it that went with french oak as well as hungarian so there was one hungarian barrel in there and i love adding hungarian to cab franc because it adds initially it adds some some spicy complexity um, but it smooths out even more than any French barrel does, it smooths it out after about 18 months in barrel or even less. 
um, depending on the size of the barrel. So I, I love having the Hungarian in there. Um, but because of the small size of the winery here, um, anything you use yeast wise, the most powerful yeast becomes your yeast, whether you like it or not. So everything that year happened to be William Selling yeast. Even if you thought it wasn't, it was probably William Selling yeast. Um, but went, went through full malactic, um, that was in barrel, inoculated before going to the barrel. But I, I will always also um, press off early just to get it off of seeds so you don't get a whole lot of seed tannin in there. So I'm pressing off around six bricks or more and then finishing it off in tank before going in barrel. So it's completely dry before it goes in barrel. Um, but then it stays in barrel and you don't have to rack it for quite a while because you rack it. You, you actually press it into the tank and then you're racking into the barrel, getting it off those heavy leaves. So it, it was on the soft leaves for that one was on the soft leaves for at least 11 months before racking it. And then it, it went, I think this went about 14 months in barrel before bottling. So this one is, it is a uh, pretty dark on, it's still, you can probably medium it's, like I would, I couldn't read through it, so it's at least a medium. But it is a very um, uh, soft tannins, the nice silky tannins on it. It's, it, you know, so if you're saying that's the Hungarian, that's a, it's a nice finish that goes along with it. And um, it's again, it's got that characteristic Cap Franc. It doesn't have the bell pepper. I don't know if the people who are watching are are bell pepper fans or not. Uh, that's going to be a, a question we'll talk about in a second. Um, but uh, it's a shame that you're not going to be able to get that fruit again. Uh, Leah and I were talking about that on the live. <laughs> Boo to bell pepper. <laughs> um, you know, we were uh, talking about that on the live is what it's like for the winemakers who are sourcing their fruit and when those things change. Um, so let's go back. Christy, I, I don't think uh, you've talked about why, why uh, how you fell in love with Cap Franc. Uh, yeah, I fell in love with Cap Franc because of my family history. So um, Tessier is the original French version of my last name, and my family comes from the Loire Valley. So I started off um, in 2009 with Tessier, and I made only Pinot Noir for the first couple of years. And then I added um, Cap Franc in 2015 because I had a whole bunch of great bottles of Cap Franc from the Loire and I was really inspired by it. And I, I felt compelled because of my family, you know, lineage. And then I just found, you know, making it, it was, it was easier to make than Pinot Noir, but that was my same approach. And I love the complexity that it, that it gives. And again, like the floral notes, the earthy notes, it just, um, it, it just checks all the boxes for me of like my favorite things in wine. So we're hearing that a lot. That's a common thread of it check, you know, it's checking a lot of boxes off, right? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Is there anybody I'm, else who wants to share? I'm, cur I'm curious from other, other winemakers, Peter. So, I mean, I have not done any work with Hungarian oak. Um, if others have done work with Hungarian oak or American oak for that matter in Cab Franc, first French or just neutral barrels? I usually just do neutral barrels, like used four times at least, because I really want to mm -hmm. taste the fruit because I'm so compelled by the fruit and the terroir. That's just my approach. Yeah, I agree with Christy. My, my barrels are five to 10 to 15 years old, and then I use punchins as well. Okay. Yeah, the, the, less, the, less, the less the oak pops out of the wine, the better it is, I think. Um, I've used Hungarian oak and cab making and American oak and cab making and made the mistake of making uh, 2006 cab franc with a little bit of a, a used American oak. And they're just, they're just, they're just a little too obtrusive, it seems to me. Not, not necessarily in Cabernet Sauvignon, but I think in cab franc. Hungarian oak, I mean, I think is probably less obtrusive than American, maybe more so than French a touch, but I, I, we try not to use anything that's, that's younger than three or four uses and, and big, large format yeah. too. I, I have tried, um, everything as far as bear 
parallels with Kev Frank, and um, I got to the point where I love punchings for it, obviously, because it respects it so much. Um, I was shocked at how the um, American Oak punchings responded with it, to be honest with you. It was kind of a gamble because I thought it needed the the um, softness of French Oak, but I have had, I like it a lot, actually. And I don't know if that's stem. Does anyone else here use stem in their Kev Frank? A little bit. Yeah, I do like 30%. Perfect. Cool. And I think I think sometimes that has because the, there to me what I really love about Cat Franc is there's certain varietals that that everything is contained in the vineyard when we pick right right, and I think Cat Franc is one of those. Um, Sandra Vesi is one of those. Charbonneau has been one of those to me. Um, Muvedra has been one of those to me. Um, Cab Sauv not really you know but what we use everything that's included the yeast the stems everything that brings in uh, Syrah can kind of be considered that a little bit. And that's Cab Franc falls into that to me, but it's one of the only Bordeaux variety. It's the only Bordeaux varietal that does fall into that category to me. Cool. Yeah, we use um, we've used French, uh, American, and Hungarian oak. And I guess my observation is American oak seems to just be getting better as the years go on, or at least some of the producers. Um, I'm pleased with what I'm seeing, but for uh, Cab Franc. Yeah, we're keeping our ratio of newer barrels uh, really low, around 15%, um, just to get a little bit of oak influence in there. I haven't used Hungarian with Cab Franc. It's mostly older neutral French oak barrels, um, maybe some newer French oak, maybe an American barrel or two, but our Hungarian barrels I've used for some other varieties. If you're just wondering, my observation is Hungarian is kind of like the poor man's French barrel. I mean, it's <laughs> it's not it's good, but it's a lot of what you want out of a French barrel, but maybe just a little bit edgier than a French. Got it. Cool. Thanks, everybody. <clears throat> um. So the next one I want to talk about is Jones. Okay. Uh, Jones Vondrell, and this is from North Carolina, and I ha I have to preface this with of the wines that uh, were participating, although I was very excited to have everybody participate, I, I was really totally psyched to have have this wine come in and talk about Cap Franc because it's a region that you don't hear that much about. And so to learn how Cab Franc is in North Carolina was very exciting to me. So uh, Diana, you want to come in and give a little bit a uh, story about your Cab Franc and uh, Tanner. I don't know if you want to do the tasting, uh, but. Yeah, I think I'll let Tanner take this one and talk more about the what what he does in the winery on this one. Okay. Yeah, so Cab Franc for us, it definitely starts in the vineyard with just managing uh, the vigor of it because in North Carolina, we have a lot more rain than probably the regions that you guys grow Cab, Cab Franc in. And what we get is just uh, tremendous vigor. I, I like to, when we're tucking vines, if it gets behind us, I'm like, okay, we're going out and we're going to wrestle with like LeBron James and Yao Ming sized vines. Like they're just huge. <laughs> so we end up having to hedge uh, at least twice through the season and really just uh, controlling it early, trying to get, you know, good thins on the fruit and the shoots and the leaves and everything. Um, and, but that's how we can control the pyrazine load so that when it comes into the winery, hopefully, you know, you know it smells fruity instead of <laughs> vegetal once I get the grapes in. And then the fermentation, what I think that when you grow grapes in a region that's a little bit wetter, you get a shifting of the tannic profile and stuff. I would compare what we're doing. If you've tried any uh, wines from Uruguay, uh, I know that they're growing a lot of Petit Verdot and Tanat and things like that down there now that are uh, getting distribution. But I would say like there's some parallels there. We're not exactly the same. Um, but my observation with Cab Franc at least is it ferments. It, I don't want to compare it to Pinot Noir because it's not Pinot Noir, but it ferments kind of like Pinot Noir. You get it in and it cooks fast. Like it's done in a few days. Um, but we do what we do to try to slow that down is we'll at least uh, try to chill the fruit, maybe like a cold soak oh briefly. Um, and then uh, when fermentation kicks off, we'll keep it on the skins for a while. And I realize 
you know, some people, a lot of winemakers I know that work with Cab Franc maybe use um, different techniques, more, you know, carbonic maceration and, you know, pressing hot. Uh, we really, we let it kind of soak up everything that it's got, which is a little bit, a little bit on the, um, you know, we might be taking in a little more of those seed tans and stuff. Uh, but the part of our process that I think, uh, you know, ends up making it really work for us is uh, we use thyme a lot, a lot of thyme. <laughs> Time's an irreplaceable ingredient. So we keep the barrels on the soft leaves for uh, two years uh, before we move it. And then um, in the last year, year and a half is where I'll try to just make sure that I get the wine cleaned up well so I can get it through the filter. And um, that's the process for it. It's, it's a long time, but I think that that aging in barrel and it's mostly neutral French oak. Um, I try to get a little oak influence from, uh, you know, I've played around use it, trying American on it, which I, I do, I give Canton uh, their flowers. I really think that Canton makes a nice American barrel. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, we, just try to give it that time so that it can really just develop and evolve. And uh, what I've observed at least is if we do see some of those fresher vegetal characteristics, um, they seem to really go away and kind of integrate with age. Um, and just working on the East Coast of the United States, we, I've worked with Cab Franc in several places and it's always very different. Like if you talk to a producer in upstate New York, they're going to do things like I've heard some people from there, they bleed their Cab Franc to like 30% of the juice they bleed off when they crush it to try to concentrate that and get a little bit more tannin and stuff in there. And then there's other people who they're pressing hot. I mean, it's really like on the East Coast, everybody's just throwing stuff at the wall to see what sticks. But there's a lot of interesting Cab Francs and they're all very different expressions, completely different than France or California. Like it's, it's not the same wine at all. But that's what makes it fun is that everybody's trying to uh, see what works and they're trying to make something special out of it. Hey, Tanner, what's your typical harvest date? Uh, so I would say it, it can vary, but I would say between the first week of September and the third week of September. Um, and it just, Cab Franc's nice because it's it ripens sooner than Cab Sauv for us. So it can kind of fit in the we, we have a shorter ripening period than probably most of you guys. Uh, we might get bud break in early April and then we need to um, harvest yeah yeah September uh, so you know that we need things that can kind of ripen a little bit fast for us uh, it, they're more consistent the things that ripen earlier we get more consistent quality on right and what what kind of sugar levels are you getting in harvest typically that, that's what uh, that's why cab franc is alluring for a lot of east coast producers is because it can uh, it can sugar up to i mean it doesn't sound like much if you're in california but we get 23 24 bricks on it so then that's nice because yeah. those are nice numbers for us too. Yeah, no, perfect like, yeah numbers and balanced yeah, <laughs> like that cool. tanner are you are you near Asheville? Uh, so we're not, uh, we're like two hours from Asheville, but there are, uh, there's the wine region around Asheville is they're growing a lot of Cab Franc and also things yep. like Lunar out there. Yep. Um, yeah, yep. Ash, the Asheville area, it's a di way different climate over there. A lot of their vineyards are more high elevation. We're at 1500 mm -hmm. feet. So, you know, we're up there pretty good, uh, but out there, some of them are even You're, higher. They get are you in Blue Ridge? We are on the edge of the Blue Ridge Escarpment, so we're literally like cool. where the the flat or the the Piedmont Rolling Hills comes up against the mountains. Like the mountains that we can see from our vineyard that are like less than a mile away, they rise mm -hmm. up about three thousand feet. So we're on what you call an isotherm. Um, a lot yep. of apple orchards hug that escarpment because they're protected from the frost. So we're I grew up in Virginia. I know that I know that area fairly well, but I wasn't sure where exactly North Carolina you guys are. Cool. Yeah, Northwest yeah. North Carolina. So. Tanner, you want nice. to send that nice. water out west? We'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> you want to send <laughs> that water out west? We'll take it. Let's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a big pump. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. We have a question um, that they want to know 
why and what are winemakers trying to add to the Cab Franc? And I don't know if they're if they're talking about varieties, added varieties that they're adding to the Cab Franc or the, you know, what you're trying to express in that Cab Franc. So if wine man can maybe clarify exactly what um, they're asking in that. And in the meantime, we can just say, so what, what are you looking for in, in a Cab Franc as a winemaker? What are you looking for in that finished product? What do you want to present it as? Looking for length, looking for great acid drive, looking for balance between um, uh, whatever tannin we're going to get. And we do a lot of extended maceration. We don't do carbonic maceration, but we're, we're fermenting basically in one and a half ton bins. And we can, we, we might go in 2021, I think went two, two and a half weeks past dryness, just kind of uh, the caps eventually dropped. And we, you know, we, we would normally punch down two or three times a day. And as you get closer to dryness, you're looking for, I'm looking for texture, texture elements. I'm looking for um, tannic support of acidity in fruit and, and tannin coming from just more time with, with the skins. I'm looking for, you know, it's kind of, it's a, it's a sort of ineffable thing in a way. You kind of know it when you know it, you get, we, we, <laughs> we press off when we, you know, we taste every day, plunge our hands with the cap and taste and make our notes every day tasting the bins in the same order every day so that we minimize you know variations in the in the like and we we figure out ultimately the wines feel the way they're supposed to feel let's press them now and we know that we're not going to get a great amount of contribution of anything from a barrel standpoint a little bit of, a little bit of rounding off of edges perhaps over over time uh, we're not looking for any kind of contribution of flavor or aroma from wood, but we are looking for that kind of micro oxid oxidation that we're going to get from from that barrel time, just to give us something that's long and something that's beautiful and something that you know has great flavor and great pace in the mouth from acidity and has that supporting tannin in the finish that that I for me is that sort of scaffold or that stage upon which this the, you know these beautiful lights of acidity and fruit kind of shine that's where we're not looking to add necessarily we do blend um but we have several different cab francs from different areas and and we'll blend depending upon what we what you know where the wine fits in our portfolio but generally speaking, we're looking for as much purity as we can get. And we're looking to not manipulate things. We're looking to be shepherds rather than, um, you know, slave masters or taskmasters or whatever you want to call it. We're looking to to help Cab Franc become, you know, that's that's our job. And so Wyman has has uh, kind of elaborated a bit. He's, he said a lot of the Cab Francs that he has had, he's noticing that there is a lot of blending like you were saying Stephen, within it um it's still very dominant cab franc but some other blend you know some other varieties are going in there so maybe we can go around the horn and you know state you know if you're if you're blending a little bit of another variety into the cab franc what are you typically looking for because there are some better marriages than other so if you're looking to blend a bit in what are you what are some of the common wine uh varieties that go well with cab franc i'll piggyback off of, sorry who, who was speaking? No, go ahead jake all right i'll piggyback off of um steven in the sense that um i'm looking for this i'm looking for the voice to sing but i'm looking for a little more cowbell you know <laughs> but, but in the but in the sense that like um not where it's like will ferrell on saturday night live where he's taking over you know <laughs> Just adding a little bit more so, and it's a delicate thing because Cab Franc, that's the thing, that's why we're having this discussion today is because we all love it for its own unique, um, its own unique um, qualities, right? And in that sense, I think when we, when I go to blend, I want to, I want to build, build a little more body than sometimes it gives me at the, at what I pick it at. Um, it's very resilient to tannin, it's very resilient to age, and it's very resilient to time. Um, acid is always a common denominator in it and and when you do that with a lot of other wines that we use for blending it can be can mask it very quickly and so i like 
very little small touches and i think that's all it needs so just a touch of cowbell and we're good that's what we're looking for touch of cowbell awesome i like it i i, I think to me it's always uh making cab franc that cab franc that i like um kind of personal not not to be not to be personal and driven but to me if somebody has uh if, if you love the wine it's easier for you to talk about it it's easier for you to um, just have a passion around it, especially when you're talking to others about that wine. Um, you're not trying to, I know a lot of people that will make wines to get scores, right? You can you can develop a wine to, to essentially score against it. Trying to develop a wine that is um, to your palate. And if others have your same palate, then they're gonna enjoy it as well. Um, and to me, always those, the blend, you, you could blend almost anything with Cap Franc, personally. I've had Petite Syrah, I've done Cabernet, I've done Malbec, um, Petit Verdot. They all tend to kind of work pretty well. And it's always your the Cab Franc, you're gonna get whatever varietals you can have to make it even better, um, to push it across. Um, so it's still Cab Franc as, as Jacob said, but you can kind of just make a better wine with it. David, you've got to use Merlot a lot in your blends, I would yeah, think. Yeah, it's, it, it look, as, as we, we sort of talked about earlier, look, the advantage of, uh, of Cabernet Franc is improving Merlot. Um, it really, because they're, they're two totally different grape varieties. Merlot is all is all heart and body. I always call Merlot the prince. Um, uh, I call Cabernet Franc the princess, and they marry up together very well. Because Cabernet Franc is is about it's all about aromas, fruit expression up front, and everything. And the length, Stephen, that you've talked about consistently, the for us certainly in Bordeaux, that comes out with a bit of ripeness. You get that it's a little slightly spicy uh aroma to it and it just lives in the mouth for you know seconds and um that's the real ingredient that makes it so successful with food so really for it's an enhancement for me of, of merlot the only thing that i sometimes we have a couple of little rows of really put in for for viticultural reasons a bit of, bit of petit verdot adds quite often a bit of a bit of tannic backbone and also a bit of color in there with cabernet franc but as our Cabernet Franc gets better in the vineyard progressively, that's less and less necessary. But always for us, it'd be fruit forward at every stage. Let the fruit express itself. Just, just get it right in the vineyard and let it it'll roll from there. Absolutely. Okay. Awesome. In, in Oregon, we have to, in order to put uh, a single varietal on the bottle, it has to be 90% of that single varietal. So uh, if it's Cabernet Franc from, if it's Pinot Noir from Oregon, it has to be 90% Pinot Noir, but it's always 100%. Um, and, and same thing with Cab Franc with, I'm not going to do 90% Cab Franc. I do hundred percent Cab Franc, but if I do do a blend, I have one and I am model, I have two actually, but I, I model them after a Loire blend. So I, I'm, I play with the Clos Roche Blanche method of 40% Gamay, 60% Cab Franc. I can't take the credit for that blend, terrain blend. I do make a, a play on words. I caught my Oregon terrain. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's a Gamay Cab Franc blend, but otherwise I'm hundred percent varietal. Awesome. And we do have another question, but before we get to that, we want to do our next tasting. So we have Dracino Wines, uh, 2018 Cabernet Franc. So Michael, you want to talk about this? Are you going to do that? Or are you going to do the question? No, I'll do the question <laughs> after that. Okay. All right. Got it. I was, I was, I almost fell off the rails there. Um, so a 2018 Cabernet Franc, um, that's being sourced from the east side of Paso. Um, so it's all being sourced from the same vineyard. Um, it's a it's a blend of uh, clone one and clone three twelve uh, coming out of that vineyard. Um, typically looking for a bricks coming out of vineyard between twenty five and twenty six. Sometimes we get up to twenty six and a half, depending how late the season. Um, Stephen, I know you asked before about picking harvest time. Um, usually, we're anywhere between the first and second week of October. Okay. Get that to get that bricks level. Um, Typically, this vineyard, a um, lot of minerality coming in through this vineyard. Um, and to get that bricks level, we do see massive acid drops. Um, our acid drops are, are, are pH from those grapes can be coming in around 4.2. Now, my education um, background is chemistry. Anybody who read, our, read the website? So I'm a, I'm a numbers geek when it comes to that. I will pull numbers from across the vineyard lots and lots. Um, Typically when I'm uh, making the wine, um, we do a little bit of whole cluster and we do about 10% whole cluster. Um, this year was really bad. The racing coming out of Paso was, was massive. So we didn't do a whole lot of whole cluster just because the, there was just so much 
um, so much, uh, so much, yeah, you kind of, stems. Kind of, yeah. So, um, typically target a, a, a TA, um, just because I'm a, I'm a chemistry guy, I'm looking for a TA. I let my pH fall wherever it's going to fall, but I'm typically looking for a TA around 0.6 to, to 0.7, um, to kind of give a lot of that, a lot of that acidity. Um, again, like others looking for, uh, the wine to come through. So not doing a lot of, of new oak, that wine, uh, the 18 has got about 25% new French oak um, age. The rest of it's all neutral barrels. Um, I like to use a lot of white wine barrels. Um, I don't like to, use, like to use used uh, red wine barrels. Find white wine barrels that just tend to give a lot of complexity and a lot of that, not the oak profile, but to give a, a little of as, as uh, cutting off the edges, make it a little softer, make it a little rounder. And that 18 is 90% uh, Cab Franc. 5% Cabernet Sauvignon, 3% Malbec, 2% Petit Verdot. So that's kind of a, it's, it's the, the allowing us to, to play wine um, and bringing a blend together and, and making a, making a better wine. All right. And um, it is, it is actually very licorice-y today. There is a lot of uh, dark red fruit and there is licorice going on. Um, and I've again, had that wine and it's beautiful. Oh, <laughs> just to say, because I, I can't speak for anyone else here at this moment, but I have had that one. And it is a and I have had the 18. It was fantastic. Thank you. Uh, so Allison, who is known as Cab Franc Chronicles. So, uh, you know, we've got a, an expert here on on the love of Cab Franc and everything Cab Franc. Also, uh, previously, she had mentioned when we were talking about the Hungarian oak. She was wondering if people had um, had the opportunity to taste any uh, Cab Franc from uh, Villeneuve, uh, which I have, and I it was it's beautiful. The wines were really exceptional. Uh, we had the pleasure of being a guest there to speak about Cab Franc, so it was quite the experience four years ago, which is hard to think that it was that long ago. But she is asking, how do the producers deal with working with uh, free run wine versus press wine in terms of maturation and blending? That's a good question. <laughs> I think we're just diving a little deep. I'll, I'll be in. honest. This is one of the this is one of the varietals because I love the strength of it. Um, this is one that I just keep them together. I will be honest about it. So. Um, I have lots that I keep separate. I have things that I keep separate, but um, we're a small winery. It's very hands-on, and and um, so the heavy, the stuff, that the press, we do separate them early on. But at the end of the day, they all go into the same tank before we split them up to go to their 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 own ways. Um, and I can't do that with every varietal. Let's say that. But Cab Franc to me is one of those varietals, and that's one of the reasons why I love the varietal because. It has that strength of integrity. What I find with ours is, um, I didn't mention, we, we attempt to do delistage with it because uh, the way it grows for us, uh, the skins are a little more delicate. So, you know, the seeds drop out. And so we try to get as many seeds out as we can to avoid that seed extraction. But, you know, by the time, um, you know, macerated for quite some time, you know, three or four weeks, um, I just don't think I get a massive difference between a free run and a hard press after all that maceration. And especially considering the thinner skins, uh, some of our other varieties like Petit Verdot, I see a lot more whole berries left over after a longer maceration. So I can see where, you know, I'm going to get uh, quite a bit of difference. But yeah, I just, I keep them all together um, kind of for logistical reasons, but also because uh, even when I taste the harder press stuff until it gets really, really high pressure on the press, then we just cut it off and don't worry about getting the rest of it. Yeah, yeah I separate. Oh, go ahead, Steve. Hey, go ahead, Leah. I was just saying, I, I definitely separate mine and the drain definitely goes into my reserve lots and then whatever's left over goes into the cuvee. Well, we, you know, we, we, 
our, our press cycle is a man, kind of a manual. We have an old Booker press with no with no electronics for doing a program, so it's all manual. So it's usually an hour and a half plus on, on a press cycle, and we're always tasting as we go up, you know, 0.2 bar, 0.25 bar. Ultimately, we get to one, you know, one and a half to 1.75 bar. So it's not it's not real, real high pressure. And we find, you know, it, as as I'm tasting these cuts these these you know press fractions as they as they're dropping into the pan i i realize that you know there's there is a difference in tasting there's a difference in tan and there's different color that sort of thing as you go from one press fraction to another but if you if you're looking at volume of juice your press fraction our press fraction is is a very small percentage of the overall blend so even if we get a little bit more tannin in the press fraction it's going into 90 percent of the wine, let's say. So we generally are blending the press fraction with the free run juice um, uh, because we, we do want a little bit of tan in there again to kind of highlight the fruit that it's supporting ultimately. And, and we're not, you know, we're harvesting somewhere in, you know, 20, 24 to 25 kind of maximum range for us. Um, we're, we're the, the kind of press protocols we're using, I think, have worked well for us over time. For us, it would be very straightforward, very, very, very simple, really. Yeah, uh, it, it always is, is press wine included, but it's a gentle press. So we're on a sufficiently small scale where we literally just use a small little compact um, water-driven bladder press. Mm -hmm. And literally one bar is max, but it is, as Stephen said to me, it's, it's, it's a question of tasting continually every five minutes. And when it starts to go too tannic and too green, that's the moment you cut off and um, you get on with the next batch. Right. Yeah, free run, free run goes in and gets combined with the rest um, as it's going through fermentation. You might keep it separated if you get a lot of free run, if you get a lot of damaged fruit, um, at least until you, at least chemistry again, until you get the chemistry there. Um, but most of it winds up going back in. Um, too small to, to toss all that away. And then uh, we go to about one and a quarter bar, uh, one and a quarter bar, and then call it, cut it off. I, I would agree with that. And one thing that I'd add in is year to year, and I only have three years experience on this, whereas you guys have a lot more. But uh, even even these three years that I've had the experience with, every year the Cap Franc has well, every fruit has yielded differently on the press cycles. But this year specifically, 2022, um, pretty much all the fruit, once I got beyond 0.9 bars, got very, very little out of the press between 0.9 and 1.2, 1.3, um, which is only a two-ton press that we're using, an air bladder two-ton press. But still, we're, last year probably got twice the amount or more uh, of the pressing between 0.9 and 1.2 bars. And we stop at 1.2 on everything. Um, but especially when you're getting such a small, small yield of, of juice at that point. And anytime we, if we keep that juice, we're tasting as everybody else has said here. Um, and if it's tasting in any, um, if you're getting any of the green out of the seeds or any of the tannic out of the seeds um, that you don't want, then we just won't take that out of the pan. We won't, we won't drain that pan into barrels. We'll just, take that pan and use it for something else. But th this year was really weird relative to that, that yield though, in that we got a whole lot more yield from the fruit that we got a whole lot less fruit out of the vineyard. We got about 25% less fruit out of the vineyard this year. Um, but we got 25 to 30% more juice out of the fruit that we got. And then those pressings, everything, it, it, I'm, we're only going one to two weeks on a fermentation cycle and still at the end of that, we're getting very, very little on the higher press run yields. Excellent. All right. So next up, the le next one we want to dive into is a Tessier. Tessier. I'm probably adding an accent in the wrong place. Tessier. But Tessier. Oh, I did say it right the first time. I corrected myself. So this is from Healdsburg. And uh, so if you can give us a little geekiness about this. And I... Uh, you have science in the background too. So Michael and, you know, Christy can really geek out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a, um, a degree in biology, microbiology. So my first career was in research 
um, working with the government and then working for um, biotech companies. And then I switched careers and started my own label. <clears throat> That's why there's the microscope on the label and the label is a microscopic image of sage oil. Yeah. yeah. So um, I've started working with Kemp Franck in 2015. I was using a vineyard, Alegria Vineyard from Russian River Valley, but then I switched vineyards for 2019. And this one is from the Camino Alto Vineyard in El Dorado. I don't own any property. I like to say that I do it in a punk rock style and I don't, I just source fruit from all over and bring it to a custom crush facility and make the wine there and, you know, take care of it. I, I do have to sell it too, which is a whole nother animal. Um, but anyways, so this, the 2019, I harvested um, at 22 bricks. I like to pick on the early side. I feel like there's a more array of flavors and I'm also looking at the pH. Um, so that kind of guides uh, what, what my bricks level will be at. Um, it was picked on 1002. So it's kind of late um, in, in 2019. And what I, my approach is very similar to all the other varietals that I do, Maved, Pinot Noir, um, what else do I do, Grenache, um, I feel like I'm missing one, Syrah. Uh, I, I do a little bit of whole cluster. So anywhere between 20 to 30%. This year I did 30%. So um, put that into the tank and then we de-stem the rest to go into the tank on top. And um, native ferments, also, the, this vineyard is really interesting that it's high elevation in El Dorado, um, cool volcanic soils, um, elevations like 2,000 feet. Um, so I'm really intrigued by that, like big diurnal shift to like being at higher elevation. Um, I just thought like more uh, nuances would come out, which that's what I'm always after. Um, and it's also... Uh, organically farmed, although not certified. And that's always like my criteria for Tessier. That's what I need to work with. Um, so whole cluster tank, 30% 30, 30 whole cluster. Um, for the fermentation management, I'll do pump overs. So drain and then pump over to wet the cap down. So I'm not imparting any more tannins. Uh, I just feel like the very first year that I did it, I foot stomped and um, did a punch down punch down for, for cap management. And there were a lot of aggressive tannins. So I changed my tactic up front and I feel like that was a big improvement. Uh, so I let it go to dryness and then I press, um, I add all the, the fractions together. I mean, um, it's, it's not that much. I mean, this lot was uh, eight barrels. So probably two barrels were from like harder press, the rest was free run. And what I noticed when you press more, you get more tannins and like the pH goes up. So it's fine because there's like six barrels that it's, it's good. It's good all blended together. I do keep the lees in the barrel to um, soften it and, and just kind of, I don't absorb any oxygen. And, um, and it also I think creates more complexity. I, I go into neutral French oak barrels and um, these, this, this lot was aged for 16 months. Awesome. And oh, were you going to say something else? I'm sorry, Christy. Oh, Thank okay. You. So I, I want to ask this question um, because I have a very uh, issue with it, I guess is the best way to say it. So how do people feel about the fact that it is called Cabernet Franc? and Cabernet Sauvignon. Do you think that because that Cabernet is in front of it, that that leads to more discrepancy of the understanding of how beautiful Cab Franc is and how it is different? Do you think that that has an issue to it? Or what do you think is the issue that keeps Cab Franc at this moment as that underdog to its prodigy, progeny? I still think the Cabernet bit is uh, that's that's the the greatest disservice that um, 
Cabernet Franc as a parent did to its child was to give it its same name. <laughs> <laughs> that was a disaster. Yeah. <laughs> had, it, had it, for instance, been Sauvignon Cabernet, you wouldn't understand Sauvignon Blanc today. But it was called Fair Cabernet enough. Sauvignon. And that has really had, and you look at it, and you know, and I'm sitting here in Australia, despite the the background, and uh, and I see the same here, and the, the whole thing, it's the same in, in in North America as well. The whole thing has become shortened to, do you want a glass of Cab, or do you want a glass of Cab Sav, or do you want a glass of Cabernet? You know, we had Cabernet Day, and that was invented by social media people with absolutely zero context about wine. But it catches on, and that word Cabernet is the difficult bit to break away from. Mm-hmm. It's like um, I, I it's not cap front thing, but I listened to this podcast that's a uh, crime in sports, and their number one rule is that you can't name somebody junior. That if if it's a junior, you know it's there's something going awry. If it's a junior, so mm-hmm. <laughs> that follows that suit. <laughs> Anybody else? What do you what do you think is the the issue with why Cap Franc is stuck as an underdog? I, I you know I think part of it the the name's a problem. Livermore Valley, terrible name for an appellation. Horrible name. <laughs> We're trying to figure out a way to get beyond the fact that nobody likes liver. Um, <laughs> <laughs> more liver, more liver. <laughs> more liver. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> names uh-huh. names are important you know the, the uh-huh. if you know the, the cab franc and the cabernet sauvignon thing is is um a challenge i think maybe a greater challenge is a critical conceit that a wine has got to be gobs of fruit and in your face this and all of this crap that you know was sort of promulgated by parker at first and the and the wine spectator is caught on where there's no room for elegance and there's no room for subtlety and there's no room for for all of the the the, the more fragile things as it were um, in in terms of defining what's good what's great what's 100 points and all that kind of stuff i think that's a larger issue than than cabernet sauvignon and cabernet franc we can call it franc if we want in europe i know they call cabernet sauvignon sauvignon they shorted sauvignon a lot i mean they the, the i think there's the the larger challenge for for me is is how how do you you know how do you how do you convince the press how do you convince the wine buyers at restaurants and wine shops that just because it's not going to kick you in the teeth with 200 percent new oak doesn't mean it's not really great wine and and that's a that's the the larger issue that that i think you know hopefully with all of our efforts here um will you know we'll, we'll, we'll be able to deal with down the road but yes the cab franc and cab sauvignon is unfortunate i think that is so well said and i think that's so true i i, I think in north carolina in our part of the uh country you know people are more aware of cab franc um, even in the restaurants, it seems to sell well. And maybe it's because Cab Sauv doesn't grow as well here for us as Cab Franc does. Um, but in terms of, you know, visitors to our tasting rooms, they're familiar with Cab Franc. So it, in that way, it's a little bit easier for us because, you know, it, it's a really good wine. But I think your point about being a more elegant, complex wine versus in your face, big, you know, juicy, tannic, that's the issue. I kind of feel like being an underdog is actually an advantage, I will say. Um, and, and hear me out on this. I, coming in a state that everything's about Pinot Noir, I worked for pioneering wineries here in Oregon, um, Erath, Adelsheim, wineries that back in 2005, when I was going to sell that, those Pinot Noirs in New York, there were still very little Oregon wines on those lists. So I come from a state where we're always still having to find our way on a, on a restaurant list. Um, of course, now it's 2022. It's a little bit different for Oregon than it was in 20, 2005. But I, I, I see a similarity here in that um, from my standpoint is that I'm now I'm, I'm in Oregon again, not showing <laughs> Pinot Noir, but showing Cab Franc and nobody's doing what I'm doing here in Oregon. There's like maybe 
a handful of people making Cabernet Franc here. And I find that as an advantage because it comes down to storytelling and, 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 and taking something that it, we all know is an elegant grape, um, is super food friendly. And the wine professionals out there who are Psalms love Cab Franc. I don't have to sell it. I don't have to sell it to those people. They love those wines. And guess what? They turn around and those are hand sells to their customers. I see it as a massive advantage, honestly. Okay. Um, I think, go ahead, go ahead. Go no, ahead. I was just gonna say, I think I the- off once already. <laughs> I, think there's an, I think there's an element of one of volume. Um, there's just not a lot of, cab, of, of Cabernet Franc acreage. So when you, when you turn around and look at just getting in front of consumers, um, you know, you look at restaurant wine list, it's cab and cab blends. It's not broken mm -hmm. out any other way. It's, it's like Cabernet and Chardonnay. Those are just what everybody goes to. It's what everybody gravitates to where um, you have so many other elements from, from Cabernet Franc of where, where it, it kind of stands on its own. Um, people, are look, people aren't going to go up and ask for Cabernet Franc. They're going to go up and ask for Cabernet. They're going to go up and, and ask for uh, uh, some, some red wine, whatever it's going to be. So I think it doesn't help that the press um, pushes it that way. And then consumers in turn just glob onto that and they just continue to replicate it. I, I, I think someone said earlier that was it that Cab Front called us, right? Um, David, yeah, David. Right, yeah. David, right? Um, I think Cab Front to me, it, one, it is a smaller quantity, so there's not as much out there. Two, to me, it's kind of a litmus test of who I'm talking to and who I'm tasting with. Sure. In the sense that, like, someone that is intrigued in Cab Franc is, like, I know that there's, they have, like, they have a depth of wine, not, like, a depth of, like, ex like looking for something that, like, Cab Sauv just, I mean, yeah, Cab Sauv can give it to you, but it's so over the top, and it's, and you gotta, you know, it so falls into a, such a small little pipeline. And I think that's the beauty of Cab Franc and why we're, again, why we're doing this and is that that is what it, that's what it is, you know? And um, so I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think it's actually, it's actually what makes it what it is. And it helps us to define who we're talking with and what, um, what, what their interest with the wine is, you know? I have to completely agree with you because that, I like the fact that it's the underdog because when pe people walk into the winery, there, there's probably about 25 different wines they can drink here. Seven of those are Cabernets that my, my friend does. Um, and, and when we say Cab Franc, people's eyes perk up. And I'd say probably at least 25% of the time, people's eyes perk up. And when they drink a good Cab Franc, they're like, there are a lot of producers out there that produce crappy Cab Franc. <laughs> so when you produce good Cab Franc, I mean, I mean, that's, that's what made Merlot so bad is that there was so many mass producers of Merlot and then also sideways, but, um, but Cab Franc in and of itself, I mean, where I bought Cab Franc from this year, I only bought two tons, but the vineyard's been producing it for, I think, 19 years now on that vineyard property. And it's never been a single varietal because all the rest of the vineyard is Cabernet and the one big winery, which is. I think it's the Delcado family out of Napa. They buy all of it. They buy the cab franc and the cab and they just blend the cab franc into the cab. So this family is so happy that I bought the cab franc. So it's going to be the first expression of their vineyard as a single varietal. So I, I think it's making more, more headway, but I like the fact that it's the underdog. And I like the fact that you use the term underdog because it is, it's, it truly is. And people love it. Yeah, it's like a secret call sign when you go into one of those speakeasy bars. You, you need to know the right call sign to get in. Well, when you say Cab Franc, when you go into a winery that makes Cab Franc, everybody else is going to smile. Okay. Absolutely. All right. The, the last bottle I have, uh, Stephen, and I'm going to let you pronounce it because I do Spanish, not French. <laughs> um, so, so, <laughs> so L'Otra Cote, uh, the Lotra. other four. It is um, is the name of the wine. It's um, a basically it, it's a it's a separate brand, I suppose, from Stephen Kent Winery. It, or it's we're, we're still trying to figure out how to how to how to shove it into a into the, the proper hole. But Lotra, my my thought process on Lotra when we first started making it was that we were going to make a right bank blend 
sort of equivalent to lineage, which is our left bank blend. Lotricote was the other shore, is what it means, and, it, and it's the uh, kind of a sort of a, a oblique way of of referring to the right bank rather than the left bank. So that's where that's where Lotricote comes from. The wine itself, Livermore Valley Cab Franc. Um, uh, which wine did we send you, by the way? I can't remember. Um, 2019. Okay, can you turn that around for a second? It's got a tap here, which I've got to say I tapped and nothing happened. So I don't know what I did wrong. Okay, so you got to point your phone kind of straight at it like that. And it, it, there's an NFC, there's an NFC trip chip in it. So it'll open up an app on your phone. You can see videos and different kinds of stuff on it. So, cool. um, and we're I think, one of the first in America to, to do this. They do it in Pens or they do it in, in uh, Australia. Penfold. Does my camera need to be on? No, it should just kind of hold it against there for a second. And it works better with iPhones rather than others, but it, it, you know, we're dispensing with it. So. Oh, uh, I was, I'm trying, I'm going to keep trying while you talk. Yes, there you go. There you go. So, um, uh, it worked. there you go. <laughs> Excellent. It was expensive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad it's working. <laughs> um, so let go. So we do a couple of different Cab Francs. We, we have one that we do for restaurants and for stores. That's hundred percent Cab Franc. And then we do one, which is the one that you have, our, our um, allocation wine, 2019 vintage. This wine actually won't be released until March. And it's it's 75% Cab Franc and 25% Cab in this particular case. Um, the Cabernet comes from an old vineyard in Livermore um, that is right up against a horse farm that has a lot of um, pepper trees and eucalyptus trees. And so we kind of segregate off several rows of that Cab Cabernet Sauvignon vineyard and ferment separately because we get a lot of herbal quality from that. And then we'll add that back to certain cab blends in a, in a judicious way to, to add a little bit more of, you know, terroir driven kind of quality from that site and add a little bit more complexity. We use that cab in this blend of uh, ends up being like two thirds Gilmetti vineyard, which is a vineyard up in the hillsides of the eastern foothills of Livermore Valley, about a thousand feet above sea level. If you if you've ever been through Livermore on the five on 580 headed east, you see all the windmills. This vineyard's right up on that hillside. Um, our diurnal temperature range at this site, and and we're one of the rare valleys in California that's east west oriented. So our the western edge of our Appalachians about 25 miles east of San Francisco Bay, but all of the hot air temperatures coming from the other side of the Altamont Pass draw this cold air in from San Francisco every afternoon. And so we'll get diurnal temperature ranges of 30, 40 degrees from day to night, um, typically throughout the growing season in Livermore. Our harvest dates, and the reason I was curious about Tanner's harvest is we're harvesting Cab Franc early November, late, late October, early November at 24 bricks or so, 24, 24 and a half at, at this particular vineyard, Gilmetti Vineyard. Uh, there's about four acres of Cab Franc there. It's a Bordeaux clone of Cab Franc, an Antov clone of Cab Franc from Bordeaux. Um, it's not the clone, I think clone five from California, um, which also has an Antov number, but this is a real Bordeaux clone that we love. It's one third from Sockow Vineyard, a vineyard about four miles west of that site that is that clone five from California. So we've made Cabernet from both of these vineyards, Cabernet Franc from both these vineyards, uh, and and really adore the Gilmetti Vineyard Cab Franc. That's kind of where we're headed. We're not getting Sockow anymore after after uh, 19. 2020 in Livermore, everything went down the drain. Smoke taint was so dramatic here that we have nothing from Livermore coming out in the 20 vintage. So everything went to a, to a, a brandy distiller, I think, ultimately. Um, Gilmetti is our preferred site from, from this area. It's a 25-year-old vineyard at this point in time. VSP um, uh, produces probably three to three and a half tons per acre. Harvest between 24 and 24 and a half to 25 bricks maximum. If this year was a lot tougher because we had 116 degree temperatures throughout several days around Labor Day in, in Livermore, uh, made it difficult to, to get stuff you know, 
ripe. We're not picking on sugar so much as we're picking on pH levels and we're picking on just the way things taste to me. We're looking, you know, seed texture, seed color, that kind of thing, skin texture. Uh, ferment in one and a half ton plastic bins in a kind of a plywood frame. So they're open top fermenters. We hand punch. Um, we did some experimentation with pulse air in not only the one stainless steel fermenter we have, but but in bin as well this year, and that worked. It worked. Um, it worked well. We think we're early early days, but it 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 was a very different way of of extracting, and we're gonna get used to. It, it was really fun, actually. What did you, you know, find we, in the bottom of them? Yeah, <laughs> we, 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 we <laughs> yes, there was a lot of. Uh, 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 once once we got the stuff out of fermenter, it was a lot more beat up than just yeah. right. punk over. We can't make <laughs> punk over out of these fermenters because there's no valve. So it's yeah. either a punch down with a metal tool yeah. or it's it's this pulse air. Um, you know, we're we're looking for extraction uh that's appropriate. You know, everything we try to do, we try to be appropriate to the variety, try to be appropriate to the vintage. Um, we're not obsessed with color. So we're not looking to try to, to you know, to maximize the amount of time that the 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 that the the grapes are on the vine, and which leads to softer skins, which maybe leads to more extraction of color and the like. Um, we we our wines are are dark enough, and and what we're looking for instead is we're looking for a balance of acidity and a balance of 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 sugar at that point in time. So that we're going to get alcohol levels, you know, in in the high thirteens to mid fourteens, depending upon the season um we we uh will typically so what we did in 2000 and and um 22 uh we we've we inoculate with a couple different yeast strains that we like and um uh i i i love the idea of doing native ferments but we're in our facility the, in the facility that we share with a larger winery it works beautifully for white wines not so well for red wines um, so we we have decided because we don't do Chardonnay anymore, and 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 we inoculate with a couple different strains that, that typically work really well with Cabernet Franc. They they provide very different uh, flavors and textures and 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 uh, aromas throughout fermentation. We really love this idea of getting a lot of smoked paprika as our as our pyrazine uh, representation, as it were. <laughs> um, they it 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 for us um we really we love that flavor and it for us that means we've picked on the right side of that pyrazine line you know it's it's not green anymore but it's still herbal in a way and um we we actually pressed off in 2022 with four different yeasts two different for two different uh presses so we we kind of matched what we liked flavor wise and texturally in 22 uh, and pressed two different yeast soft together two the bins that had two different yeast soft together so two different cab francs will have ultimately from the same fruit in 19 we pressed off uh, um, Sakao and Gilmetti separately they're in barrel separately they're in in larger format as I said before punchins older punchins. We again, we're, we're after what Cab Franc brings us, not what Cab Franc with a tea bag full of oak will give us. Um, and and so we we're, we're tasting constantly through fermentation, tasting constantly at the press pan, we're tasting constantly from barrel. So we we kind of gauge where where we you know when we want to take wines out of barrel, which is typically for us with neutral wood, you know, about eighteen months or so is what we end up finding, especially from the larger format barrels. Um, and, um, we, you know, we, we, we filter the wines and, and, uh, they go into bottle. Awesome. Uh, Leah, I, I don't have a bottle for you, so I can't show I'm the bottle, so sorry. but that's okay. I, do you want to talk about have... your, uh, well, I was going to say, do you want to talk about your Blanc? What do you want to talk about? I, I have my, uh, my, my reserve with me okay. actually. You want to give um, a few I, minutes about it? Sure. I love talking about the Blanc, but I. I feel like I talk about it all the time. Okay. <laughs> um, it, it is my signature wine, but I, it's nice to be able to talk about the reserve. Um, this is my 2015 um, Clo Rogue Valley. I call it Clo Rogue Valley because it's, I wanted to call it Clo Rogue, but um, there's a, some discrepancies in Rogue Valley with what you can use and can't use based on different wineries. Won't get into that. <laughs> Didn't want to cease to exist. Uh, cease to exist so, <laughs> assist, so there we go. Um, but it's, 
kind of throwing a, a, a star to Clou Rougeard. I mean, that's my true north wine, um, but making the point that the Loire Valley, uh, you know, Southern Oregon is not the Loire Valley, but I'm making some um, connections. And really the connections come out to terroir and, and what I'm working with. And my two vineyards that I, I've championed in from the Rogue Valley have been um, Sundown Vineyard and Crater View Ranch. And Sundown Vineyard, sadly, this is from Sundown Vineyard, um, the 2015, um, and we're going to talk about this in our, we're doing a master class on Cap Franc and on, for, in Fort Oregon on Sunday, on Cap Franc Day, um, but I want to say that with, with this reserve, um, and it's a few years now in bottle, uh, Sundown Vineyard was really the special site in the Rogue Valley going up to 16, 1800 um, foot elevation. Uh, they had some of the Cabernet Franc blocks are Scott Henry trellis, and then the rest are VSP. And, and I did not work with the Scott Henry trellising. I only worked with the VSP. Um, and in the Sundown Vineyard, there was just a lot of clay loam, um, just a beautiful, dusty, earthy, but then we utilized um, irrigation and canopy management to dial back our, methox our the methoxypyrazine. So um, timing of when we cut the canopy as well as um, drip irrigation through the most of the growing season. And then as we got closer to picking, we went into deficit irrigation. Um, and that really helped to dial back the methoxypyrazines in, in, our, uh, in our wines. So um, with Sundown, unfortunately, we talked about this, Lori, um, the owners decided to sell the vineyard and the new owners want nothing to do with wine business. So they pulled out all the vines, many of them 20, 25 year old vines, which was a complete heartache um, for me, heartbreak. So anytime you see now a bottle of wine that's Sundown Vineyard, this is, you know, more valuable because it, it doesn't exist anymore and I can't make this wine anymore. Um, so hold on to those bottles. But um, I typically pick uh, around October 7th to the 14th, depending on what's going on in the vintage. Um, and when we bring the fruit in, um, you know, it's really, in, it's incredible because they do a meticulous job picking the fruit for us. There's very little material in, in the bins when I receive the fruit. Um, but I go right, usually comes up from Southern Oregon. I live in Newburgh and I make my wine in, in McMinnville. So I'm five hours from my, the vineyards that I work with. So when the, um, we send the grapes up on refrigerated trucks and then when they land at the winery, they go right back into a refrigerated reefer and I keep them there overnight. So I'm chilling the fruit down to about, by the time we're working with it, we work first thing in the morning. Um, by the time we start my fermentations, it's 55 degrees always. Um, I also add dry ice as we sort. Um, I 100% distem and I do a, a light berry crush our skins are very, very thick. Um, and if I were to do whole cluster, same thing with the Gamay I get up here, the skins are so thick. I, I really can't do whole cluster um, with that kind of uh, intensity and in skin and the, the chewiness. So we do a light berry crush. So I get little, almost like a pinprick size, um, like little blast in each um, berry. I, it varies on the berries. Um, but that helps really with the maceration and, and we cold soak for about four to five days, adding dry ice um, and doing gentle punch downs. And I keep it in a refrigerated room so it's staying cool. Um, and then when I'm ready to uh, kick off the fermentation, I also am in a winery where there are multiple brands and I don't want any, I'm a control freak. I don't want anyone else's stuff to mess around with my stuff. So I inoculate with non-GMO yeasts. Um, and I'm very OCD about that. Um, my bins are meticulously, um, I go in by hand, winemaker in the cellar and pull out every leaf, every, every jacks. Um, I don't want any stems in my cap bronc. I pull it all out. Um, and then I punch down the next day and I pull out the leaves. I pull out the stems. I wipe down. I, I, I don't know. I should have worked in a hospital, I guess, but <laughs> But um, I really take the time to, to manage these, um, my 1.5, like Steve and I use 1.5 fermentation bins. Um, and my fermentations typically last um, anywhere from two to three weeks. 
they grow very slow. I never peak higher than 70 degrees, 77 degrees during fermentation. Um, and that's why I really like to start very cold. I don't want heat spikes. Um, and I work, it's usually cold and rainy by the time I'm up here in Oregon, by the time I'm working with my stuff. And because we have ambient temperatures in the cellar, um, we're able to close off space and keep things cool. But, um, and then I do press off and let things settle for a while. Um, I, I don't mind things settling in stainless steel for a few days just to make sure it gets dry. Uh, before going to barrel and neutral barrels, French barrels. Um, I bought a lot of my barrels um, from Ponzi wine winery. Um, and so I'm getting their best. I go in there. I typically in the past would go see Louisa and ask for the oldest barrels up there that they had to sell. And they're usually their best barrels because they're keeping them around for five, you know, vintages. Um, so I'm getting their best barrels at five vintages and, um, and several of those barrels are now 10, 15 years old. So it's really exciting for me. I do my own barrel repair. Um, and I believe like barrels are like your friends, the older, the better. Right. So, um, I take good care of my barrels and, um, yeah, I'm obsessed with my barrel repair and, and regimen of caring for these barrels because they are hundred percent part of the story. Um, and then of course I use punchins as well. And the, as I mentioned, the pressed, um, I'm sorry, the drain juice goes into punchin first and then um, everything else gets equally distributed into um, these older bar barrels that I lovingly hug. I do hug my barrels. Um, that sounds crazy, but it's about negative ions and um, it's a real thing. There's science behind negative ions. And so I also sing opera to my fermentations. I'm half Italian, you know, I do. It's just, it's all that little extra love. And we know about um, um, how music can create, a, can create a healing mood. So like I do this thing in my own little separate world. That's about as like esoteric as I get, but um, cause I, I also have a science background too. And I studied holistic nutrition and Chinese medicine. Um, and so I have a really, different approach on things. Um, from the science, I, I took a lot of microbiology, organic chemistry, and, um, and definitely utilize that in my, in my winemaking. Um, I also 100% filter. I use cross-flow filtration. And um, to me, it's only filtration. I will, it's, it's, I mean, I can do sideline, sideline, sideline. You don't lose aromatics. In fact, you're removing colloidal material that prevents you from actually getting the natural fruit esters. And so to me, it's like, I'm a hundred percent all about uh, cross-flow filtration. And I, I like to go, I write about it. I've written essays about it. Um, and when I was in school, I did a, a paper on it. Um, and I, I think if you open my, a bottle of my wine, you'll see it's not lacking on flavors or aromatics from filtration. So from cross-flow, it does the opposite. Um, and what else? Um, <laughs> Uh, let's see, I like to use time as well. So with these reserves, um, I manage there the, the regimes about, it's French oak used uh, uh, punchins. These are used punchins actually. Um, and the reserves are 15 to 20 months uh, reserve. Some of them are 24 months, depending on what I'm making. Um, and then I bottle age for at least a year before releasing, um, sometimes longer. So it's really time is, is part of the winemaking tool, um, for me, for in my toolbox. Awesome. And, um, yeah, so I probably went longer than I meant to, but <laughs> awesome. there and you so go. <laughs> we actually are running late, but I want to give David a few minutes to talk about how he produces his wine. And while he's talking, I want our final question to be, uh, you know, as we kind of wrap things up for each winemaker to just say, you know, how they can find you. Obviously, everybody who signed up for this, the website does have your a link to your website was in that event, bright. So they they have your website. So you don't need to say that. But just somebody asked, and I think it's a great question. When do you recommend drinking your wine? Do you want it upon release or do you, how long do you think it can sell her? And then David, if you could just talk about your wine and then we'll wrap that up with that last question. Oh, thanks Laurie. Yeah, look, uh, look, my, my observation is just a, a little different. It's fascinating listening to the conversation, listening to all, there's a, there's a lot of high tech uh, talk in there. 
Um, we've been certified organic producers since uh, 2016, although we're fairly newcomers to the game, having started in 2010. One of the principles I guess I was taught from day one in moving to organic viticulture, and now we're moving to regenerative organic viticulture over the next few years, was that it all starts in the vineyard and that once you get it right there, you get great fruit, it'll fall through to, to good wine. And our wine making is is pretty pretty straightforward and simple. It really is everything as much as possible is done by hand. You can't do everything that way, but we, we like to do it that way. And we're very small. You know, we've only got a, an acre of Cab Franc and an acre of Merlot, pretty much. And literally get the fruit to the winery, um, destem, light crush, put it in your vat, two or three different phases of of well, initial maceration, then fermentation, um, progressing more and more as we get better from, you know, um, pre-prepared yeast to natural yeast. Um, keep it simple when it ferments to dryness, which is usually 10 days through 14, 15, very much vintage dependent, but, you know, the data tells you where you're up to. Uh, take it out, press it, put it in back into vat, um, and then you have you know just do a, do a runoff again to remove the yeast and solids before it either goes into barrel or stays in tank. Typically for us, the uh, debate on on barrels is fascinating, and there's a lot of great stuff going on in the the side chat as well. Um, we certainly started off on one year old barrels um, in Bordeaux. Look. I'm afraid French is French and it pretty much goes that way. That's what you'd expect. You can get some others, but if you want some secondhand ones at a reasonable price, that, that, that's good. Um, look, we've started with secondhand barrels, but bit by bit in order to, and I love Leah's context about, you know, treating her barrels like her babies. The, um, that's important. They are a very, very important asset of uh, your wine that that micro oxidation and maturation process is critical. So we start off, but with sort of older barrels, but now more and more, we bring in one or two new ones a year to do a continual turnover. And typically probably the barrels start off with brand new working on Merlot. But then when they've got a year of age, we might start then switching them over into Cabernet Franc. The best one I can tell you at the moment, and Leah is absolutely right, barrels like hugs, barrels like kisses, and ours get that every day that I'm there, certainly. Um, for me, it's as much wine's a natural product. So, you know, you, you, you know, you go out and talk to your vines, you communicate with your vines, you spend time with your vines, and that's critical as well. And yeah, giving a barrel a kiss is totally natural. But in the process of doing that, if you kiss it in the right place. You know, <laughs> <laughs> You will get an immediate <laughs> feedback. Happens when you keep in the wrong place. <laughs> don't, kiss, don't kiss it on the butt. It's very close to where your bung is, because that's where your yeah. wine is closest to, to the point you take it out from. You can get an absolutely amazing update on where that wine is at any night. It's always done by night. It's a bit more humid and cooler. You get better, better flavors there. <laughs> And I can tell you for our 2021 Cabernet Franc, which was in barrel for probably eight, 10 months, something like that, before it gets uh, bottled off. Um, it is a barrel that is about four years old that has the best in. And, um, and, it, and when you do the smell test, that's perfect. When you go around and then do the actual sampling test, it's the same result. It's fascinating. And I've not got a great nose or palate at all, but you can pick that up in an instant. For us, the future is all back, uh, passed into the vineyard and back into the soil. Um, getting that that marriage right between healthy soil and uh, and your vines and relating that through terroir to your to your final wine is important. So for us, keeping the wine making very very simple and practical. We only have a garage. If I move my head, you can just about see it. And <laughs> it there. <laughs> garage there. Garage. There's only twelve, fourteen David. barrels in there maximum. David, I'm sorry. Um, what when do you normally pick? Um, for us, look again. It, it tells us, but in Bordeaux, it's coming forward. It's coming forward. We just picked the 2022. Ooh, about the 10th of September. Ooh. But 2021 was first and second week of October. Wow. Yeah, it is wow. very seasonally driven, and 2021 wow. and 2022 is two different seasons. We're so far apart. And what, 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 was Bloom that far ahead? 
Yeah, I mean, you just you just follow it, and um, you know, I, I don't know who was Stephen or, or Michael was saying, you know, or Peter, you you're getting out there, and I'm, for us, it's a weekly basis. You're taking samples, tasting them, uh, checking on what their sugar levels are, and and, and you guide it in. And that difficult thing, and that's what the problem you're finding in Bordeaux, getting that balance between, say, a Merlot that is not overripe, but doesn't have the right sugar, or too much sugar, but not ripe, is very difficult. Cabernet Franc has a much wider um, maturation window, is what we're finding. And if you said to me right now, what are you going to plant next when, you know, we're, we're rich and famous? um and buy a little bit more land the answer will be straightforward it's going to be cabernet franc because it has got that climate resilience mm -hmm. and after that i probably go to malbec and the blend of the year coming up in the future will be cabernet franc driven malbec that nice. is a delight to drink mm -hmm. cheers my friend okay. so as we wrap up, I want to thank everybody for joining, and I apologize that we went longer. But uh, so, if everybody can just give a quick, like, one minute where they can find you, and then please answer that question of when, uh, you know, if people are purchasing your wine, when you think they can uh, seller it to. Okay. And mm -hmm. Jacob, I see you as a big, big screen for me, so I'm going to start with you. Um. Wieser Family Vineyard, Blue Victorian Vineyard in Sassoon Valley. Uh, easiest way to explain it is exit 41 on I-80, opposite of Jelly Belly. Go the other way. <laughs> and, I, and, and you'll find us. I mean, that's the best way. Um, we've been around for a long time, but um, cementing it down over there. Um, when to drink? I, I have a, I never like to tell anyone when to drink wine because everyone has their own, like, what they're looking for out of it. I think I get better right now as being able the wines are coming forward a little more sooner. But like I said, I don't I don't ever like to tell anyone that answer. Okay. That's a good answer. Uh Leah, how about you? How can people find oh. your wine? And then uh when do you recommend cellaring to if if you do? Yeah, I, uh, I don't have a tasting room, but I do have a garage and we take uh, people up here by appointment only in our garage. So it's 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 a pretty cool garage. That's why we bought our house. We're, we're based in Newburgh, Oregon. And like I said, we make our wine in McMinnville uh, and we source from Southern Oregon. And uh, I am distributed in a few states, but you can find more variety um, from me online. Leah Jorgens and Sellers, you have the, the websites up. Um, and how long can I, can these wines age? Well, you know, the first wine I ever made in 2011 for myself, um, was a white Cabernet Franc and that wine I'm down to six bottles is really starting to show beautifully. So, um, because it's Cabernet Franc. So I would say that, um, that these are timeless wines that, that if you sell them properly, why don't you come back? I would tell the customer and tell me how long you you cellared because I think they have the potential for a 30, 40. I'm looking at Bordeaux as my guideline here All as right. my true, you know, it, I, I, I love believe it. these wines can age. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Steven, how about you? Uh, Stephenkent.com. Um, and then there's links to Lotra Coat and our store. If you want to get wines online, um, I just I want to thank everybody. I want to thank you, Lori, for the amazing job putting all this together. Um, this is a, a, a small but growing movement, and, and I'm, I'd love to be part of it. Hope you all tell your friends about the amazing thing that Cab Franc is, and it's been a blast with, our, with the fellow winemakers. Uh, for the wines I've had, uh, they've really been exciting wines. I look forward to tasting everybody's wines, ultimately. Um, we do a lot, do a lot of writing and stuff on Cab Franc related things and wine related things. If you go to winesaveslives.substack.com, there's a lot of stuff on there that we we do for the company um, that that really is about Cab Franc and about winemaking and about why we love what we do. Thanks for having me. It's been a total blast. Awesome. Well, thank you. And David, how about you? How, do, how can we get our hands on Bordeaux? Look, um, the the one the we meaning United States of the Americas. Yes, uh, sorry. <laughs> um, with a generous dose of, uh, of of import tariffs and three tier systems and blah blah blah. Um, look, it's not an easy process, and I haven't given up on it. In fact, for most people, the easiest way now would to be to go to paradiserescue.com or any of our social media sites. Just go to Instagram and hit the hit the bio, 
and we'll try and get it to you directly. It's much easier actually to put half a dozen bottles in a carton or a dozen bottles in a carton and send it straight to the United States. We've got all of that in place. We can send anywhere in the world. Um, and that's the easy way to do it. But think of importing awesome. it and stacking it somewhere and everyone else. My goodness, we haven't got all day for that. Let's stick the Cabernet Franc and have a fun afternoon. In terms of security, one little thing for us. When we started in 2010, we had, were clueless. Um, I think we may be a little bit better now, but anyway, you can judge. Um, they all said, and we all panicked, our 2010 Cabernet Franc. We thought, no, nah, this will go nowhere. Everybody locally said, Pfft sell that next week because it won't last um you know a year <laughs> it's 2022 that wine and it's, it's a little bit still available in australia here is selling absolutely magnificently it's one of the great fine wines that we've ever produced and it just keeps getting better from there but it, it's got the legs on it. It, it it'll do another five to ten years easily and it just becomes absolutely amazing Beautiful. Keep it going, man. And thanks to laurie well done <laughs> thank you mm -hmm. uh, diana tanner I think Tanner's off, so I okay. will answer this one. Um, yeah, we uh, what we sent to you was a 2017 Cabernet Franc. Our um, our very first vintage was 2012, so we're still relatively young. Um, we think they're going to age beautifully, um, but I guess time will tell that. And um, we are about uh, an hour to an hour and a half straight north of Charlotte, close to the Virginia border, right off of I-77. And um, of course, we do ship around the country to specific states. And um, hey, if you're in this part of the world, come and visit with us. Fantastic. Michael. Uh, so DracinaWines.com, you can find us there. Um, again, a big thank you to everybody here. I, one of the things I, I love about this probably group as well as just the winemaking community is how um, once you kind of make that facial connection, um, you kind of become friends for life and you run into trouble or you want to try something new and you're like, hey, um, have you ever tried this with your cab front? You're like, oh yeah, I've done that this many years and stay away from this. So you want to try something new uh, or you want to share any of those experiences, um, love to share them, uh, love to share within that community. Um, and then kind of super excited. We just signed a, a lease for a tasting room that'll probably be open at the end of January. So I'm looking awesome. forward to that. Cool. And uh, Peter? Awesome. CelineCellars.com and the address on that on the website is actually my buddy's winery. So we're about two blocks away from Russian River Brewing in Windsor, California. So anybody's welcome to stop by here. Otherwise, the website and I love Leah's answer for, for cellaring of wines because you never know what people's profiles are on wines. So I would echo that. And Christy? Uh, yeah, Tessier Winery, I guess the link is up. Um, I do take private tastings at my house in Berkeley and also at the winery in Healdsburg. Um, that just needs to be planned out a little bit further ahead. And um, I would say, you know, buy three bottles of Cab Franc, then you drink one now, and then you determine such amount of time, you retest it again, and then you have a third one to like, let it go longer or, you know, drink it again. So yeah, only you know. <laughs> right, absolutely. I feel like I forgot somebody. Did I forget somebody? No, all right. All right, well, I wanna say thank you to everybody. We had um, 35 participants viewing. We had 68 sign up. So, you know, that is a lot of Cab Franc love. And I wanna thank all of the, you know, winemakers who came on today. I do apologize, it went longer, but that just goes to show how much awesome conversation there is about Cabernet Franc. And if anybody does have any other questions, please feel free to send me an email and I will pass it on to the winemakers. And, um, you know, I hope that this was a positive experience for everybody. Sunday is Cab Franc Day, so share it on social media. Tell us how you are celebrating Cab Franc. Please tag all of us if you can on social media. We all love to see um, everybody drinking Cab Franc. We do, you know, even if it's not their wine, they like seeing Cab Franc, right? So tag them and um, thank you everybody. And here's to Cab Franc Day on Sunday and hopefully more celebrations next year. So thank, thank you, Lori. Thanks, Lori, and everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Cheers. Cheers. Bye, everybody. Cheers.